Greetings from First United Methodist Church of Los Alamos, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. We have now resumed in-person worship with one service at 10 a.m., which is live streamed both on Facebook and on YouTube. We alternate each week between contemporary and traditional music. You may confirm worship times and receive more information by visiting our website, firstinyourheart.org. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our scripture reading for this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew. After the scribes and Pharisees see Jesus and the disciples violating Sabbath rules, they challenge Jesus, but he chastises them about not knowing or practicing mercy and calls for all his followers, who are his family, to have their words match their actions. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So once upon a time, I worked for a nonprofit group that was promoting building low-income housing using uh, environmentally sustainable building materials. And we been, built a demonstration straw bale house out on the Navajo reservation as a possibility of providing adequate housing for those who were wanting to continue living a traditional Navajo lifestyle, in particular for the elderly. To help prepare for that build, I borrowed my father's truck and picked up a trailer full of straw bale. And we loaded the back of the truck with straw bale and drove it out to the building site about 40 miles south of Gallup. And I parked it where we thought would be the best place to be able to unload the bale so we didn't have to carry them too far. And as soon as I stopped, the truck and the trailer promptly sunk into the sand. And we hoped that as soon as we got all the weight of the straw off of the truck that we'd still be able to, to get out, but of course we couldn't. The more we struggled with it, right, you spin the tires and they just go deeper and deeper, you get yourself into a worse spot. No matter what we did, no matter what we could come up with, we couldn't get the truck unstuck. Eventually, two other trucks who were not in the sand and also had four-wheel drive were able to pull us out. And I'm sure that most of you have probably had that experience where you're stuck and you're just spinning your wheels, metaphorically and literally, right? Might be sand, might be snow, but more than likely some of us have been stuck in the mud, right? In fact, all the struggles you do, the more you work at trying to get unstuck, the more stuck you actually get. Being stuck in the mud could be a metaphor for life. And so that's where we start today as we're beginning a, a new worship series called Down on the Farm, into which we're looking at some of the agricultural stories we find in Scripture, as well as lessons from the farm that help us grow in our faith life. And I do have to note that I got this idea. In some ways, I stole it from Adam Hamilton, in particular from the last sermon of this series. And I also note that I know some of you grew up on farms or had family who had family farms or around agriculture, and I really didn't. The area outside of Phoenix where we grew up was surrounded at the time by cotton fields and or orange orchards. Now it's just fields of houses, but that's what it was like when we were growing up. But we had nothing to do with them. My only connection to agriculture was this little side garden we had at the house. And what I can remember of that is I hated weeding. And I really disliked the large green caterpillars that were attracted to the tomato plants. 
And so I know very little about actual agriculture, and so I've had to, to dig around through the extension ministries of various universities around the country trying to, to learn a thing or two about farming and agriculture, and I might have learned just enough to be dangerous. And so we start at the beginning, literally in this case, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. Because, again, Scripture is full of agriculture stories and agricultural metaphors. And in the second creation story in Genesis 2, which is very different than the first creation story in the first chapter of Genesis, we are told the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. God planted a garden. That means God is a gardener. Right? I don't know if God had to deal with pulling weeds or dealing with the green caterpillars or not, but there is an earthiness to this image of God. That God is tilling and sowing and reaping and harvesting this garden. And this isn't the only time this imagery about God and gardens and planting and harvest is found in Scripture that somehow scripture wants us to know that God is connected to the soil. And then, of course, we find more of these stories throughout the, the New Testament, especially in the parables that Jesus tells. And that's because the people that Jesus was dealing with were largely people also connected to the soil, that they were growing their own Food. Even if they happen to live in cities or towns, more than likely they still knew family members or others who were growing the food that they were eating. Right? And so these agricultural stories resonated with them. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying to them, and they understood the meanings and the metaphors and the literality of these stories because they were connected to the soil. That's largely not the case for us anymore. As a general rule, we buy our fruits and vegetables and grains and other things from stores, right? We don't grow, grow what we eat. And what we do buy generally has been picked way before it was ripe in order to travel the hundreds or more than likely thousands of miles to get to us. So it'll be ripe when it appears on the shelf so we don't overlook it. It looks good, right? They wax it and they water it to make it look good, but we know it's not quite as good as what you get from the garden. That's why the fruit stand just down the street is so uh, popular, right? Over going to Smith's or somewhere else and picking it up. And if you've tasted something right off the vine, you know it has a taste that a grocery store just can't match. That there is a difference to what's fresh grown, to what you buy. And this is not me telling you, therefore, I want all the extras that you're going about to get out of your gardens. We know that there's a difference. But I'm also not advocating that you start your own garden if you don't have one. Although as I was sort of thinking about this this week, there's this thought that's sort of going around in my head, and I don't know what to make of it yet, but perhaps we actually are missing something if we're not connected to the soil. Because not only is God a gardener, but in Genesis 2, there's a, a word play in the, the Hebrew when God makes man. And the Hebrew says something like, Adam is created out of the Adama earthly soil. Uh, Amy Jill Levine says in English it could be something like the human is created out of the humus, right? Out of the soil we are made. From dust we are made into dust we shall return. And so being connected to the soil then I think does connect us some way into creation, into our understanding of who we are and of God and to each other. But that being said, there are lots of reasons why people don't have their own gardens. And that includes me. Every year the girls threaten to plant seeds, but the only thing we're still growing in our garden is weeds. But one of the reasons why is because it takes a lot of time to have a garden, right? Just weeding 
has to be done constantly. And Jesus does have a parable of not, about not pulling up the weeds. That's a different message for a different time. But there are lots of reasons why we don't want to do that work ourselves. Just from a, a straight economic standpoint, right? it's much easier and better just to go buy it than it is to grow it ourselves on the expenditure of our time. And yet, we also know that product just isn't as good. And so this, too, could be a metaphor for our faith. That perhaps sometimes we also want to subcontract out to others the hard work of doing faith. Or we'll purchase what others have done, right? It looks nice and polished, looks great, and so we'll, we'll take that and try to make it our own, but it's just not as good. To grow in our faith, We have to be doing that hard work ourselves. To produce an authentic faith, we have to be tending and growing and sowing and weeding and caring so that we can produce a a fruit of righteousness. And so that passage we heard from Matthew this morning is known as the parable of the sower, although it probably could be called the parable of the soil. And it begins, a sower went out to sow, or some translations will say a farmer went out to sow. And at first he scattered seeds on the path, but because the path was so well trodden, the earth was so hard, the seeds couldn't penetrate the soil, and we're told the birds come and eat, eat the seed. And next, the seeds fall on the the rocky ground, so the the ground is hard, but not quite hard enough to keep the seeds away, so the the roots go down, but they can't get deep enough. And when it gets really hot, when things get bad, the the plants wither away and die, right? Those soils didn't have enough calcium carbonates, and so the soil became basic. It couldn't grow. See, I told you I have just enough knowledge to be dangerous. And then some seeds are sown amongst the thorns, and the thorns rise up, and they choke out the seeds, and they can't grow, and they die. And then finally, seeds fall on the good soil, where where they can take good roots, right? Where the pH balance is just right. All the right nutrients are there, and they, they grow and produce an abundant harvest. And so the soil that's being talked about here is normally sort of interpreted as, as our hearts or our minds, right? And the seed is the word of God. Are we ready to receive the word of God into our lives? And sometimes we have that hard exterior, often because of something that's happened in our lives, right? We put on that hard shell in order to protect ourselves And that seed can't penetrate. We can't hear the words of God to know that we are beloved in and of ourselves and that God loves us as we are. That the seeds can't get in and penetrate and touch our hearts. Let anyone with ears listen. Or maybe our outward expression shows that there is nothing wrong, right, that we can go through through life and it's like, water off the back of a duck, nothing seems to affect us because our interior is as hard as a shell. And so the seeds look like they penetrate, but they can't uh, either take root because we've put on this face to the world that we're okay, but inside we have that shell where that waxed up fruit at the grocery store looks great, but we know it's not as good as the real thing. God's word can't uh, penetrate to our deepest levels. Let anyone with ears listen. Or maybe we've let weeds grow up in our faith life. We're doing things we know we're not supposed to do. Maybe we're associating people uh, that we shouldn't be spending our time with. Or maybe we've just grown lazy in our spiritual life. We're happy with, with what we have or what we had, and we're just not doing the hard work anymore. And so our spiritual lives are lying fallow, and the weeds just keep growing. 
let anyone with ears listen. And then finally, there is that soil, again, that's just perfectly prepared, that's ready to receive the word, and the word takes root, and it goes deep, and it produces. Let anyone with ears listen. And the typical interpretation of this, obviously, is that we want to be the good soil, right? And most of us think, yeah, I'm the good soil. At least I think I am. And yet it's my belief that we are actually all four types of soil. Depending on what's happening in our lives, maybe we're rocky soil, maybe we're good soil. And sometimes I think we can be all four soils at the same time. Because sometimes it depends on what the seed is that's being sown, right? Sometimes what we hear from God is, yeah, that that matches exactly what I believe, right? That's going to produce good fruit in my life. And sometimes it pushes us and challenges us. Sometimes the word of God says, you have to change. And that word we'd say, no, thank you. I'd rather stay just like I am. That seed just bounces off of our hard soil like the path. And this is nothing new. Ezekiel is told by God that the people are stubborn and hard-hearted. That is why Ezekiel is being sent to sow the word of God into their lives. Right? Stiff-necked is also used a lot in Hebrew scripture to describe us. Because it's part of the human condition. Each of us have all these types of soils present in our lives. And all of them, in some ways, represent being stuck in the mud. Because even the good soil, if it gets too much water, right, just turns into mud and it's not much use. And we should note here that for those who have gardens, those who grew up in farms, do you go out and scatter your seed on the path or in the road or amongst thorns? No, that's not good use of of your product. You only want to put it into the the good soil. But here, God is scattering the seed everywhere. God scatters the seed everywhere, knowing that even in the hard soil and the rocky soil and the, the weedy soil, that some of that seed is going to take root, isn't it? Right? All of us have seen grass growing up in our driveways. And in other places, we don't want it. And breaking sometimes concrete. Seed is a powerful thing, especially the word of God. That is God's amazing grace for us. And so if you are familiar with the 12-step programs, the first step is to admit that you are powerless and that your life has become unmanageable. You're stuck in the mud. The second step is to believe in a power greater than ourselves. That is something that can pull you out of the mud. And the third step is to make a decision to turn your life over to the care of God, as we're going to refer to that. And Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith, who came up with the 12 steps, which comes originally Alcoholics Anonymous, didn't create these out of thin air. These are the same things that Jesus did calling the earliest disciples on the Sea of Galilee. In fact, Dr. Bob thought that the the group name should be called the James Group, named after the letter of James, from where they were getting some of their ideas as well as other pieces of Scripture. They understood the scriptural call of learning how to get out of the mud. So have any of you ever had that moment when you could clearly feel God's presence? Maybe you even heard God speak to you. Or that time you could say, that was a God moment, right? We call those mountaintop experiences, even if they don't take place on a mountaintop, right? Those those thin places where we encounter the divine. And we see the same thing in Scripture. Jesus and James and John and Peter go up right to the mountaintop where they have that encounter with God. And what does Peter want to do? He wants to build houses because he wants to stay there, right? 
Moses goes to a mountaintop where he speaks and encounters God. And you know Moses wants to stay there because every time he comes off the mountain, he ends up in trouble with the Israelites who are doing bad things. We want to stay in those mountaintop experiences, but the problem is we can't. Those are fleeting moments. And the reality is we live in the valleys. We live in those in-betweens. We live in the mud and the muck of real life. And so we can then have two choices. We can remain in the mud. We can say, I'm going to get out of this all by myself. I don't need anybody else's help. And struggle and strive, right? And we just keep sinking deeper and deeper. Or we can actually wallow in the mud, right? And invite other people to come in and join us. Or maybe we'll throw mud at other people to try to get them just as dirty. We see and we know people who like to do this. Or we can say, I can't do this by myself. I need someone else to help pull me out. And so if you're stuck in the mud, what's the only thing that can get you out? Something outside the mud and something bigger and stronger than you are in that moment. Just like my experience with the truck on the Navajo reservation, I wasn't getting myself out. I needed two trucks with four-wheel drive outside the sand to be able to pull me out. To get out of the mud requires something bigger and stronger than we are and something not stuck in the mud with us. Someone who did not get stuck, someone who's not been mired, who passed through the other side in order to be able to pull us out, that person for us is Jesus Christ. But in order to, to do that, in order to accept Christ pulling us out, we have to first be willing to say, here I am. Help me, because I can't get out of this myself. We need to surrender, accept, and to follow. Because if you keep struggling and fighting, you're just going to sink deeper and get more stuck. We're just going to keep spinning our wheels, doing the same thing over and over again, which has not been effective. And what we also have to know is that when we call for help to get out of the mud is, if you travel 10 miles through the mud, guess what? you got to go 10 miles back the other way. You don't just instantly get pulled out of the muck of life and everything is perfect all of a sudden, right? Even when we accept the, the help and say to Christ, I need you, only you can help me here. Our lives don't get perfect and they're never totally perfect, right? There's always still bad things helping us, but we know that Christ is always ready to extend the hand and say, I'm going to pull you back out again. And I'm going to wash you clean when we learn to surrender and accept and to follow. So John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, too understood this reality. And he composed what's become known as the Wesleyan Covenantal Prayer, which in his day was uh, said multiple times a year, but traditionally around New Year's, which is when we do that as well. But I also thought it was appropriate for us today as we, again, reaffirm this first step of discipleship is turning our lives over to Christ to, again, say that prayer together. So I'm going to invite you to stand as you are comfortable. Again, remain seated if that's more comfortable as we say together Wesleyan's covenantal prayer. I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee, or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Thou art mine, and I am Thine. So be it. 
and the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. And you may be seated. So again, for those in the sanctuary, in the scripture insert on the back, um, you'll find a place to write some notes for a moment. And for those who are worshiping online, I encourage you, if you don't have this, to uh, get out a piece of paper. So I'm gonna, we're going to take a moment, a minute, and again, what is it from that message? What, where do we need to reaffirm our faith? Where, where are we doing well? That seed is taking root in good soil. And where does our soil maybe need some more nutrients, a little better pH balance? Where do we need to do that work? And so we're going to take a, a minute, and you can use this to write th things to work on for this week. So if you'll start that countdown. And let us pray. O oh Christ, just as you called to those first disciples and called for them to drop their nets and follow, so too have you called to us. And sometimes we want to hang on to the things of our lives. We don't want to let go because, honestly, sometimes we think we have better ideas. And yet we know that, that all that does is continue to help us spin our wheels and get more and more stuck in the things that don't bring healing and wholeness to our lives, but instead bring brokenness and sometimes destruction for ourselves and for others. And so help us to learn to drop our nets, not as a one-time event, but as an everyday activity. That as we wake up every morning, and we say, today, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to seek to do your will, and I pray that everything I do might be pleasing and bring glory to you. And we know that we will fail, that we will fall, and we will stumble, but we are, know that you are there extending your hand back out to us, that hand of grace and of mercy, pulling us back out of the mud once again and washing us clean in your grace. And so help us then to live grace-filled lives. And just as we have received forgiveness, to give forgiveness. And to seek your, to do your will in the world. And we pray these things, saying the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to follow our YouTube channel and Twitter, and like us on Facebook if you haven't already. And remember that every action you take today could change someone's life. So make sure it's a good one and be an agent of love. God bless.